I hope you like my new motto. I have to think about things in depth before I can talk about them with uncertainty. You know, the more you know about stuff, the more you realize that you don't know enough. So that's... Um, so if you catch me talking about something with apparent certainty, I probably don't know what I'm talking about. I send the regards from the DevOps community in Shanghai. This was, uh, this was a month ago. Um, they're, as you can see, very enthusiastic. This was before the talk, by the way. <laughs> and there's a... Uh, see the guy, the guy here? He was, um, he was taking a picture of me. And of course, this happens a lot at conferences. You, you know, p people take photos of slides. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to... Um, take a picture of the audience. So I did that, so we got a double there. A couple of weeks later, I was at Vienna at an IT service management conference, so of course I took a picture of the, of the crowd, and the photographer here kindly took a picture of me <laughs> with on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Last week in Dublin, Now, wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if there's... Where's the photographer gone? Oh, there you are. I lost it. I sort of started to panic. Yeah, right. Smile for the... <laughs> look, at the <laughs> look at the birdie. Isn't that great? What a great audience. So enthusiastic, just like the Chinese. Really good. <laughs> so in, in my next talk, you'll be in the audience and... Your picture will be up there, so thank you very much for that. Talking about uh, taking pictures of slides, I've come up with something that I call a service for slide photographers. From time to time, you'll see bot bottom right, you'll see a no photo sign, but you can take pictures of any slide. It's just that when the slide has vanished, you have the whole picture. So now you can relax. So if you're waiting for the last line on the slide, just wait until the sign vanishes. So hopefully that will uh, just allow you to relax a little bit. I was talking about Michael from Pivotal just, just after his talk. I always feel like an imposter at conferences like these. Although I started off as a programmer, you know, I don't do this. You do this stuff. I don't do it anymore. So I'm, I'm really just giving you an outside-in perspective but because I have the pleasure and honor of speaking with various communities, I hope I can contribute something from, uh, from an outside-in perspective. It's, you know, it's always interesting to, to look at perspectives. Here you see map birds, but from a different perspective, you see something else. So hopefully I'll give you a different take on something that you're familiar with. I'm also doing this from a 40-year perspective. I'm celebrating my 40th year in IT now. I started off as a programmer. And take, take a look at the axis, on the happiness axis, 100% happiness. I got, got seduced into taking on management responsibilities. You know, Mark, you're such a good programmer, why don't we promote you to a role for which you're completely incompetent? That's called the Peter Principle. That is an official term, the Peter Principle, promotion up to the level of your incompetence. So I, and seriously, this in around the 2000s, this was the most difficult point in my career, dropping the status of management roles and focusing on the content, because I'm a content guy. And for, for marketing purposes, I, I reinvented myself as the IT paradigmologist. A paradigmologist studies paradigms. I study IT paradigms. DevOps is a paradigm. It's a way of looking at IT. It's really what interests me. So I've got the privilege of looking at f having, being, having experienced four decades of, AT, of, of IT. We, you saw in the 80s, you saw there was a lot of focus on project management because we were still building systems. Systems had to be built. It's project management. In the 90s, we looked around and said, gosh, we've built an awful lot of systems. We need to get them under control. So IT service management emerged as a profession. In the 2000s, we realized that things needed to speed up. So there was a lot of focus on agile. 
And I'd say it's probably going to be a toss-up in, in, in this decade between DevOps and digital transformation. I'm sort of putting my money on DevOps. But it's interesting looking, um, looking back at what happened. You know, project management ended up in dictatorship, IT service management in bureaucracy, agile in fundamentalism, at least some agile people. So it'll be interesting in 10 years' time to look, at, look back at what's happened to DevOps. So we'll leave that as, a, leave that as an open question to think. It, it all ends in tears. That's, I think that's life's main message. It all ends, it ends in tears. The summary of my talk, DevOps is useless. <laughs> Unless seen in a bigger picture, in co-creational collaboration, that's really a key word, co-creational collaboration with the business. And like the pers one of the perspectives I'd like to give is looking at the bigger picture, realizing that you do great stuff in the IT function, but there's a prequel in the business and a sequel in the business. What about them? So co-creational collaboration. The agenda comprises four parts. Taking a look at that broader picture of DevOps, then thinking about how do you sell the value? That's one of the things that, um, that Chris emphasized in his opening talk. I, I summed it up as value-based and people-oriented. I think that was his pitch. Looking at the value, how do you express the value of DevOps to business executives who aren't interested in IT? That's going to be one of the major parts of the talk. Then thinking about where's your weakest link in the larger chain. And finally, and that's the kill DevOps bit, adopting the right attitude to DevOps. So let's have a look at, uh, look at DevOps. Um. You've probably heard about the story about the six blind men who come across an elephant. And they all, you know, one grabs the, the leg and says, I found a tree. The other one grabs a tail and says, I found a, a rope. So they have six different perspectives on one thing. In IT, however, is the other way around. Whatever you come across nowadays, it seems to be DevOps. <laughs> so there's an awful lot of hype. You've got to watch out for the hype. That's really, really, really the main message here. A um, lot of nonsense around. So look through that. Put six businessmen in a room with IT, and what are they looking for? Return on investment. They don't really give a damn what we do, and rightly so. It's about the results. Are they getting better sales, higher prices, lower costs, lower risk? They're the main, main topics that businessmen are interested in. What I'd like to do is compare these, um, these two perspectives, combine DevOps and return on investment, in an extremely simple model here, which has taken me 40 years to... I must be so... I'm a, I'm a slow learner. It took me 40 years to draw this diagram. You come to conferences like these to get IT industry guidance so that you can build better, faster, cheaper information systems and services. Hopefully, you'll learn something at this conference and do your stuff better. Business people use those IT systems and services to achieve their business goals. They see IT as an investment and they want a return on their investment. Let's dive into this in a little bit more detail. Very simplistically, you could say the IT department is about dev and ops. And from a business perspective, you're talking about demand or requirements. And then finally, when they get the systems that we built, it's about use, or as I like to call it, value realization, because this is where the value is realized. Demand, requirements, development operations, use. But for me, this is a pretty powerful paradigm. Just one more level of depth, putting it in a value stream with four swim lanes with business information applications and infrastructure, starting off with a business who want to make an investment in information and related technology. They have to specify their requirements so development can build applications. Development needs an infrastructure, platform, tooling to do its work. Operations also needs tooling, platform, a, a deployment pipeline, for instance, part of the infrastructural components to enable deployment from development to operations. It's interesting to, uh, to see where Agile fits into this picture. I like to 
position Agile here, bridging the gap between the business and IT, and ending, certainly if you use the, the common Scrum terminology, ending with potentially shippable product increments. The key word is potentially. Potentially shippable, not yet shipped. And because that's output from that Agile Scrum activity, I like to call the increments excrements. So potentially shippable software excrements that are now in production, live, in the area that some people would call IT service management, if you'd like to divide it in that way. Up until now, we've invested an awful lot of money in building stuff, but we haven't got any value out of it. Because the value is only realized when actual people use the system interpret the information, take the right decisions, and hopefully get the value out of it that corresponds more or less with the intended value that they wanted in the investments. And that's closing, closing the circle. The question is now, where does DevOps fit into this picture? Is it what Patrick Dubois used to call, maybe he still does, DevOps light, a more limited application of DevOps, focusing within the IT discipline on everything that starts with continuous, or is it, does it have a much broader applicability where you can draw the business into the whole equation? And the answer is yes, both. You can apply it in my outside-in perspective in both ways, in a narrow perspective from a, or from a broader perspective. Who's, who's read the DevOps handbook? Okay, yeah, probably 10, 15, 20%. Yeah, excellent, excellent guidance. I'm basing the terminology very strongly on the DevOps handbook. The principles and technical practices, I think very useful guidance to, to separate because they have different applicability, but they're both used to enable a fast flow of work through development, testing, deployment into production, while at the same time maintaining world-class availability, reliability, security, the operational aspects. I counted the technical practices, 67 I came up with, 40 which apply to development, 21 to operations, 22 to building infrastructure, for instance, a deployment pipeline. Now you've already noticed they don't add up to 67 because there's some overlap. And this is my personal interpretation of how the technical practices apply to dev ops and infrastructure. I think it's really key to recognize that infrastructure is, has a facilitating role, provides a platform to help dev and ops do their stuff. So I, like, I like to make that distinction. So you've got the technical practices which focus on the continuous stuff, whereas the principles, and I've included the business in this diagram here, apply to a much broader world in which the business has a, a strong part to play, looking at enabling a fast flow of work, the three ways of DevOps, getting fast, frequent and good feedback, and finally enabling continuous learning and experimentation. So the, this is the applicability of the, of the principles as far as I'm concerned. Putting that back into this little diagram, you could say the technical practices you can apply within the IT function, whereas the principles have a broader applicability. Summing up this first f four sections, the main message is beware of the hype, you know, that elephant, everything's DevOps. Realize there's a broad and a narrow application of DevOps using the principles and the, and the technical practices based on the DevOps handbook, which I really recommend as, um, as solid guidance. The second part, Selling DevOps to business executives, this is you, the engineer, trying to sell your stuff to the CEO because you're really enthusiastic about DevOps. You know, DevOps is serious shit. <laughs> but the question that the CEO asks is, why should we be investing, why should I be investing my money in, in this DevOps thing instead of in other things like buildings and acquiring companies and stuff like that? So you come up with terms like continuous containers, immutable microservices, calms as code. And you say, you know, that's techno babble. Come back when you speak my language. 
So how do you speak MBA? There's, what's that? The master of bullshit administration, yep. <laughs> it can be. They have their own jargon as well, just as we have IT jargon. These are very valuable sources of research on the value of, the, um, of, of DevOps, the state of DevOps report and the DORA uh, research on measuring return on investment in, in DevOps. And I'm referring to the guidance I found in, in these publications to... Lots. Good stuff to read this, really recommend that. Looking at how this guidance affects four properties of information systems. I'm going to go through these utility, warranty, delivery and costs one by one. Utility is the functionality that the, si that the system provides, the fitness for, for fitness for purpose. What does it actually do for the business? Warranty is the fitness for use, focusing on the operational characteristics of systems, performance, security, availability, reliability. Speed, delivery is not only about the speed of the delivery, but a really key point, the priority with which you do work. If you have three pieces of work to do, which should you be doing first? That's a key question. And do you have a way of calculating, estimating, which is the most valuable for the business? That's really key in, in, in producing value. And finally, the cost of development, the cost of operations, total cost of ownership of IT. So just going through those... Um, seeing how the technical practices and the limited application of DevOps within the IT department can affect those four characteristics. I'd say IT can't affect the functionality without involvement of the business, but you can affect the warranty, delivery, and the costs. So let's go through them one by one. Looking at costs first, say you reduce the costs of IT. In MBA speak, that results in lower operational expenditure and capital expenditure. That's MBA language, OPEX and CAPEX. But you've got to realize that reduction of your IT costs will probably only result in a small reduction of business costs. On average, what percent in your enterprise, what percentage of your total business costs are IT costs? Does anybody know that? You don't have to share it, but does anybody know? Yeah. Could you, would you share it, or is it, is it, a, is it a secret? 2.5%. You imagine you've achieved a 10% improvement of that 2.5%. You go back to the CEO, and you say, we've achieved a major cost reduction. 2.5% you know. is low, by the way. On average, people say, I've asked a professor who studies this, he said between 10 and 15%, that's average for all industries. If you're, I asked um, a guy at Air Canada, said, we spend 1.5% on IT. They spend 40% on fuel, just to put things in proportion. If you're working in the banking industry, it's probably more like 15, 20, or 25%. So it's a big, it's a big range. So you've got to realize, uh, cost reduction is usually just a small, um, has a small business reduction. If you look at delivery, however, if your products and, and services depend on IT, speeding up IT will result in quicker time to market of your products and services. If IT is only used for internal purposes, then you can talk about quicker business change. This is MBA language. If you look at warranty, improving the reliability, availability, security, performance of your applications, that will result in fewer business disruptions, therefore lower operational expenditure, less cost that has to be spent because things went wrong. If the customer is involved, if the customer is affected by information systems, it'll result in better cu a better customer experience. More satisfied customers are more loyal customers. Loyal customers are prepared to pay more for your products and services, and they often buy more from you, so that translates into more sales and higher prices. Finally, if we look at the broader application that we involve the business, we can talk about utility as well. In utility, of course, it depends on what you build. Traditionally, we've built applications that reduce business costs. We've automated human work. We've reduced risk, human risk, by replacing it with automated risk. 
But increasingly, IT is being used, look at Airbnb, look at Taxify, for instance, to disrupt the marketplace to create sales and achieve higher prices. So it depends on what you, what you apply it uh, for. So with this quick MBA course, now you're better equipped to have that, that conversation. So when you get asked this question by business executives, what is the value of DevOps, then you can respond with these kind of terms. Quicker time to market, fewer disruptions, lower operational expenditure. This is the kind of language that these people like to hear. This is, um, this is MBA. Like, you, you got it? Yeah, right. Got it. <laughs> yep. Service for slide photographers. So think about, think about the speed of delivery, the fitness for use, the fitness for purpose in particular, costs less or so. Don't mention IT or DevOps to the business. Focus on benefits, costs, and risks. Third part, where's your weakest link? This is about the theory of constraints. Going back to this, this little diagram, which I'm quite pleased with, because it, does, it gives you the big picture and it lets you think, in our organization, how well do the business decide on their investments and specify their requirements? Are they able to tell you what they want? So that's a question. Is your weakest link there or is your weakest link within the IT department or is your weakest link at the... You could say there's a prequel and a sequel to DevOps, to the IT. Is this a problem? How well do you think your, the people in your organization actually use the information systems that they have? How effective is that use? Often that is a weakest link. So have a think about that. And what should be your highest priority? The weakest link. If... Now, this is a contribution from one of the organizations that I represent. We, the ASL BSL Foundation are up there. We've focused in the past 12 years on collecting best practices around what business people do in their interactions with IT. If you think that that's the weakest link in your organization, take a look at the guidance that we have. I don't want to bore you with the details of the model just to make you aware of its existence. And get you thinking about who in the business, who owns the information and the systems, who's responsible for the information flow within your lines of business, who's responsible on the business side for the functionality and for how systems are intended to be used. Who is, look and this, this is value realization, the actual use, this is really a key, a key issue as far as I'm concerned. If one of your employees, one of your colleagues, in the or one of the users in the organization has a problem, there is undoubtedly somebody like a super user or a key user that they can turn to if they have a problem. What I would like to see is a super duper user. A super duper user who is proactively looking around how the users use the systems and helping them to use them better, helping them to realize more value. And the um, last point here, think about in the business, who, who, who manages the relationship with IT people. We often have a business relationship manager within IT managing the business relationship who's on the other side of the fence. And I've done some, uh, done some work on that. If you're interested, take a, look at that, uh, take a look at that link. Summing up this part before we round it off with the, um, the attitude stuff, Think about your organization. Where's, where's the weakest link in the chain? If it's in IT, great. Focus on DevOps and other guidance. Improve the way you work. But if it's in the business, think about what kind of guidance would help them formulate the kind of stuff that they want done before IT does its stuff and get the value out of it afterwards. And you could use our, our BSL guidance for that. Finally, adopting the right attitude. When I say kill DevOps, I have to duck because people start throwing rotten tomatoes at me. If I don't quickly explain that it's not as you might think I intend it, but it's something more zen-like. It's about the story of the, the monk on his or her road 
to awakening and enlightenment, looking for Buddha. And there's an ancient, Buddh ancient Buddhist proverb that, sells, that says, if you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. Keep meditating. So it's the Zen master with his big stick who hits you over the head and says, you will never find Buddha. But the young, the young student, the young monk thinks, I found Buddha. This is the certainty, the real truth. But the thing is, you never find Buddha. And it's, it's, the same, it's the same with DevOps. So I'm going to leave you with an ancient DevOps proverb, two, two and a half thousand years old. If you meet DevOps on the road, kill it. Keep learning and keep experimenting. And this is the third way of DevOps, of course. Keep, because you will never, you will never be able to pin DevOps down to one single truth. It's on the move, it's emerging, and that's the way it should be. So try and get that out of your head. And just be it. Be Zen. With that, if you'd like to get in touch with me on this topic or any of the other topics that I'm keen on, please feel free. Connect on LinkedIn or Twitter. Talk to me afterwards. Be m pleased to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have questions for Mark? Or is everyone completely zen? Okay, Thank then you. I think we can give another big and even bigger and louder round of applause to Mark Smalley.